Good morning and welcome everybody to our communion service today. Good to see you here. Good to have some sunshine streaming through the windows again. I think apologies to those who tried to get into the school field. Um, it is open now. <laughs> too late, too late. Um, but again, that's another little job for the Lord. If somebody wanted to take that on, then let Anita know. I think this is still, is it a bit loud? It's ringing, it's kind of ringing in my ears. Thank you, Chair. I know, I know, I know, I know. I can never get it right. <laughs> <clears throat> so good to see you all. There is um, a trade craft stall in the link if you're going to coffee. And even if you're not going to coffee, do go in and have a look at all the goodies Jane and Martin have for us today. Notices on the notice sheet. I know that we haven't had enough. More are being printed. So if you haven't got one and you desperately like one, then do come and have a cup of coffee or at least wait around at the end of the service. Um, more are being printed as we speak. So do have a look at the notices for information and to use them for prayer as well. And as most of you will know now, the sad news is our lovely Anne Taylor went to be with the Lord um, a week last Wednesday. And so we keep uh, Phil and Mandy and Debbie in the family in our prayers. Thankfully, Debbie and her daughter arrived um, from Canada on the Sunday, so they were able to spend a little bit of time with her. But when I saw her on Saturday, there was that lovely smile um, and a little joke. Um, and she knew where she was going, but we keep Phil and the family in our hearts and in our prayers. I've no um, details of when the funeral is going to be yet. Is there anything else that I've forgotten? No. Okay. So let's take a moment of quiet as we prepare to worship. And the choir will process today for the first time, and so in a moment I'll invite you to stand. But let's focus on the reason why we're here. In these last few days after the Queen's death, many people have gathered to, to welcome the new King, King Charles, the excitement of meeting him. So I pray now that we would have that same excitement in our hearts as we gather to worship the King of Kings. That we would allow the Holy Spirit to move in us and among us. And that our heart desire might be simply to give God the best that we can give him today. Glorious things of thee are spoken. Our opening hymn from the Green Hymn Book, number 362.
The Lord be with you. We say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. To sit or kneel to pray. Gather together as God's family. We come now to ask forgiveness from him, our Heavenly Father, remembering that he is full of gentleness and compassion. We say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. And we receive his forgiveness. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. collect for today the 18th Sunday after Trinity. God, our judge and saviour, teach us to be open to your truth and to trust in your love, that we may live each day with confidence in the salvation which is given through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Our young people are going to Morning and all. This is why I took Egypt 40 years in the wilderness. Come on, you guys. What are you going to be up to today? I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. I'm Joseph. Joseph, okay. You've been doing quite a lot on Joseph? This is the second year. Yeah? Yeah. Good. Have you done his amazing technicolor yet? I think he did that last time. <gasps> Yeah, good, okay. I know, they, they, do, they do know really. So let's pray 
for them now as you go to have your teaching session. Loving God, we come to worship you. Help us to pray to you in faith, praise and thank you for your gifts to us and listen to all you will say to us that you may shine through us. Amen. That's a big prayer, isn't it, really? Wow. So, so hopefully we're going to see you later because you're going to come in when we, do, when we have communion. That would be really good. See you later. Father's going to bring our first reading. The reading is taken from the second book of Timothy. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead. And in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I solemnly urge you to proclaim the message. Be persistent, whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, and encourage, with the utmost patience in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires, and will turn away from listening to the truth, and wander away to myths. As for you, always be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry fully. This is the word of the Lord. And so we sing of the place that God's word should occupy in our hearts and our lives. Again from the Green Hymn Book, number 407, Lord, thy word abideth and our footsteps guide us.
hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke, chapter 18, beginning to read at verse 1. Glory Glory to you, you, God. Jesus told his disciples a, a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city, there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, grant me justice against my opponent. For a while, he refused. But later, he said to himself, no, I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone. Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she might not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? on earth. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Father, we thank you for your word to us today. Holy Spirit, will you impart the words that you want us to hear today into our minds, into our hearts, so that we might truly serve you and walk the way that you have planned for each of us. In your name we pray. Amen. As our children went out, those words from Timothy are quite apt, aren't they? I wonder if there's a little Timothy in our group in the years as the word of God soaks into their hearts now. So let's be praying for them now as they listen and learn from God's word. (coughs) Sadly, we all know this story too well. On September the 16th, Masa Amini... 22-year-old Kurdish woman living in Iran died in hospital in Tehran. She died, as we know, under suspicious circumstances. I've read that her injuries led independent observers to believe that she'd had either a stroke or a cerebral hemorrhage, most probably as a result of the severe beating that she'd received at the hands of the guidance patrol, the Iranian government's religious morality police. You'll know too that they're sticking to their story that she'd had a heart attack, but it would appear that the other detainees who were with her in the van taking her to the detention center, which we've seen on the news last night and today is on fire because we do not know who started it. But they're telling a very different story. They witnessed what happened to this young woman whose crime, it was a biggie. She wasn't wearing a hijab, the scarf that many Muslim women wear, the head covering. She wasn't wearing it correctly, and so a little bit of her hair was showing. She'd broken the biggie rule of the very strict dress code rule for women in that country and in many others, as we know. Her death protests not seen in that country for many, many years. And listening to the radio today, um, a woman who was in the same detention centre, and it's also the centre where, um, I can't, Radcliffe, the lady that was imprisoned for many years, that's where she was held as well. But it appears that the majority of people protesting are around about the age of 15. Women, schoolgirls taking to the streets, cutting their hair, as we've seen on the television, burning their scarves in public, doing everything that they know they shouldn't do because it could cost them their very lives. But they're risking those lives because they want justice to be served. On Friday, I heard on the news that they've actually started firing live ammunition at the crowds now. And again, it made me feel quite sick that these police, these so-called morality police, are actually beating up children probably the same age as their own children. How does that work under the name of Almighty God? 
But roll back the centuries now. We meet another woman. We don't know her name. We don't know anything about her except for the fact that she is a widow. There are lots of them around, you might say. But in the first century world, women in general and widows in particular have no rights whatsoever. Culture, <coughs> excuse me, cul <coughs> excuse me, culture wasn't kind to them. Or as we know from other gospel stories, neither to children. Do you remember Jesus calling that child into the center of the disciples to be an example? Women, children, no rights whatsoever. So for this woman, as hopefully you've already done, sit down with your husband or whoever it is that's going to care for you in old age and talk about the future. Draw up your will. Sort out your power of attorney while you've still got your marbles. But the woman was widowed. She didn't have any inheritance at all. It would have come from her late husband or their eldest son. But what happens if there was no son? It would pass to her husband's eldest brother. And then so on and so on if there was no eldest brother down the male line. She had no say. She had nothing in her favor. So what's her case really? Why is she bothering the judge? If we assume that no son of hers would see his mother destitute. Could we then say perhaps that it was the actions of her brother-in-law or maybe a very distant relative's greed that is the cause of her need to seek justice? What was she looking for? Simply to be treated with respect and to receive a fair share of what she probably worked very hard for all of her life. So imagining it, what's it like to be bothered, to be pestered by somebody? Oh, go on, Dad. Go on, please, Dad. Go on, please, please. If you don't shut up, go on, Dad. Go on, Dad, please. It's 8.30 in the morning. The sun's up. It's hot. The judge comes out of his house, and she's there. Morning, judge. I really need your help. Come on, I'll walk with you to work and we can talk about my cases as we go along. He gets rid for a while. He leaves his chambers at, chambers at lunch to get a kebab or whatever he liked to eat. And there she is again. She's still there. Hi, judge. I, as I was saying earlier, um, just, you know, but I want to go and get me butty. I'm starving. She follows him to the shop and when he comes out, to go back to court, she's still there. Big smile on her face. I know that you don't have much time, and I really don't want to give you indigestion if you eat your sarni too quick, but I really do need to talk to you about my case. It's really, really important. A few hours later, as he leaves the court after a busy day, how's your day been, judge? Have you given any thought to what we talked about? Any decision made? And later that evening, when he can put his feet up, go out for a nice meal with his family and friends in his favorite restaurant, up she pops, sitting at the next table. But this time she's getting a little bit exasperated. And she says, I know I'm only a woman. I know I'm only a poor widow. But you know that I have a very good case. Why? Why won't you get me justice? You know. It's wrong. You know I have a case to answer. And here's what Jesus tells us about the judge, chapter 18, verse 2. That he was a lovely man. A man who neither feared God or cared about anyone. He was a law unto himself, as we might say. His court, his rules, his verdict end of. It would appear he's a man who doesn't care about people suffering if they're victimized, if they've been ripped off. It's not his problem. He goes to work, he does his job, he goes home, puts his feet up, end of. 
But Jesus adds that he doesn't even fear his own judgment. And you can just see Jesus saying in heaven, Cornia, here comes the judge. That was supposed to get a laugh. Yeah, it's this very man who eventually gives in to the widow's request and grants her justice for no other reason other than she persisted. She kept on bothering him. She kept on getting in his face, as they say today. And he simply didn't want her to wear him out. Verse 5 in um, Eugene Peterson's The Message Translation reads like this, I'd better do something and see that she gets justice, otherwise I'm going to end up beaten black and blue by her pounding. And the verb that's used, it would appear, because my Greek is not very good, is akin to, to a scene in the boxing ring. This is the, the, the sort of scenario that Jesus is painting here. And basically, what Jesus is saying, he gives him because he didn't want her to give him a black eye. I probably would have spoiled his image altogether, wouldn't it, really? She kept on keeping on until justice was served. So the moral of the story is, keep pestering God and he'll give us what he wants. No. Jesus isn't, of course, likening God to this man, to this unjust judge who will do whatever we ask just to get us off his back. In fact, it's the very opposite. This is one of the how much more parables that Jesus has been telling. How much more will God the Father do what is right and just for his children? How much more? Not because we're wearying him out with, his, or with our prayers, simply because he is a just God. He will answer our request for all the right reasons. And that's why it seems that he's urging his disciples to keep on praying and not to give up. If you look in the previous chapter, he's been asked, when is the kingdom of God going to come by the Pharisees? And Jesus said, well, you won't be able to sort of say on this day or that day, because for those who know me, the kingdom is already within those people. And then he goes on to talk about, as we will in the coming weeks, as Advent draws near, what's going to happen. You know, two will be in a field and one will be taken two will be in bed and one will go. So it's kind of put the frighteners, I think, on the disciples a little bit. And he's saying, you know, trust me, don't lose heart, verse 1. Keep the faith. Do your bit to proclaim my kingdom. Live by the rules of my kingdom, even though at times people will reject you. And those chilling verses that Val read to us from Timothy 2, um, of false teachers and myths and all the other stuff that happens around us and that people, some of the people that I've known who've been committed Christians go off on tangents thinking you name your guardian angel and you pray to your angel and all of that stuff. It's myth. It's not, it's not truth. Live your lives, he's saying, so that people can see you as a light in the darkness of the age in which they were living at the time and in the age in which we live now. To be light in the darkness, to keep trusting me, however difficult, however much you will suffer, as many of them did to the point of martyrdom. Be that light, trust me, don't lose heart. How much more will our Heavenly Father give to those who ask? And yet, can we really put our hands up and say all our prayers have always been answered very quickly? We've always got what we want. Actually, I don't think that's a prayer that should be answered because the way to pray is to say, Lord, how do you want me to pray? 
And then we're not disappointed when he doesn't give us the thing that we think we need because he'll always know better. But think about it. You might have prayed for somebody for a very long time. You might have kept bringing and keep bringing a situation to God that doesn't appear yet to be resolved. How has it made you feel? Have you ever felt like giving up? Even on God. People have said to me in the past, I prayed for my loved one to get healed and they didn't. So that's it, I've given up on God. It's understandable, but it's heartbreaking because he's promising much, much more than we can ever imagine. But in his way and because of his wisdom, as a heavenly father, he always knows what's best. But it does seem, doesn't it, sometimes when horrible things happen, that why God? And so again, have there been occasions where we've lost heart because we cry out to him. We ask him. We keep on crying out. How often have we cried out for Ukraine in these past weeks, in those early days when we met together, crying out together as Backwell Christians? And yet it's still happening. That's where we have to trust to keep on keeping on believing that he's got it all sorted, but it's in his way and in his time. We might think he's deaf to those cries, but I believe he isn't. And through that waiting, through that wrestling, these are the times often when he can do most in our hearts, when we're at our most vulnerable because he said, actually, that prayer was easy. Anybody think prayer is easy? But the kind of prayer that Jesus is urging his disciples to engage with, you could say, if you want to take that boxing ring analogy a bit further, that actually prayer is boxing ring stuff. What did the judge say? Let's get justice done before she gives me a black eye. I don't know about you, but boxing sport, I don't know, but I'm sure some of you enjoy boxing. I just think it's, but that's another story. But to get into the ring, you have to be fit, don't you? You have to have stamina and strength, both physically and mentally, to go the distance. You have to know your appointment. Uh, you know your appointment. <laughs> My appointment would be not in the boxing ring. Know your op opponent and certainly try to be one step ahead. And when you see them, they do all that kind of trying to psych the other out, don't they really? I think, yeah. Boxing ring prayer, but not seeking, I um, hasten to add, and for those watching as well, not so somebody ends up physically damaged, but that we gain that strength and discipline and know how to process forward. Because when we look at the world, the many dire situations, I don't know about you, but we could be tempted to think that Satan, our opponent, has got all the best moves at the moment. But he ain't. He is a defeated enemy. He's lost the fight. But that won't stop him from sowing seeds of doubt into our hearts and into our minds or from trying to knock us off course to defeat us, to flatten us in the ring. And that's why we need to keep our eyes firmly fixed on Jesus, to keep the armor of God that he's given us against those forces of evil firmly in place. If you say to a friend, if somebody said to a friend of mine, have you put your armor on, he would quickly say, I'll never take it off. And that's the thing, never take it off. Always keep it in place. Because if we're serious in prayer, and this is a whole sermon series, really, this, which is, we haven't got time for, but it is about wrestling. It is about fighting the powers of evil who will do anything they can to prevent us from deepening our relationship with God and believing that those prayers will be answered. And that's why in order to pray, the first thing we have to understand, as Paul reminded the Romans 8 verse 26, that we need the guidance and the help of the Holy Spirit because we do not know what we ought to pray for. We can have our shopping lists. We can say, dear God, bless so-and-so. 
but actually serious prayer, getting down to the nitty-gritty. It's the Holy Spirit is the one who will both guide us, but that verse goes on to say, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us, often with sighs too deep for words. And actually, perhaps sometimes the most monumental prayer is when we just sit with God and that sigh that we weren't expecting comes out, revealing the true state of our hearts. When the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray, he told them to pray a prayer that we pray regularly. Your kingdom come, your will be done. But do we actually really understand what that means? Because what we're asking, I believe, is that we're asking for the values, the character of his kingdom. In a sense, we're asking for heaven on earth. We're asking to live where there's love, where there's mercy, where there's forgiveness, where there's reconciliation, where there's unity, where there's peace, where there's healing, where there's transformation. We're asking for all of those things to be evident for them in their lives and for us in our lives too. And for justice, his just and gentle rule to break in and to transform every situation on earth. And we know that these requests for our prayers won't be answered until his kingdom comes in all his fullness. But if we are born again of the Spirit, then the kingdom of God is within us. And the Holy Spirit will transform us into lightness to be the light of Christ in the darkness. And so like them, when we pray that prayer, we too have a part to play if we are brave enough to mean what we pray. And when I pray those words, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done, I usually add, in my life, today, Lord, in my life today. Don't always remember to do it, but that's what the Lord wants, for it to be real in us, in order for us to be real in him and make him known in our world. Yesterday, the church commemorated uh, St. Teresa of Avila. So I'm going to invite you to be quiet for a moment and then I'm going to pray her prayer, a prayer which we will know. But actually, it's a prayer, I think, which serves to remind us that, funnily enough, the Lord often answers our prayers, our fervent prayers, by actually asking us to play our part and, in effect, to be the answer to our prayer. So let's just take a moment of quiet together. Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet. Yours are the eyes. You are his body. Christ has no body now but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Christ has no body now on earth but yours and mine and all of us who profess his name. Lord, may your kingdom come and your will be done in my heart today for your glory and for the extension of your kingdom here on earth until you come again. Amen.
And so we stand together now to declare our faith in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. David will now lead us in our intercessions. Almighty Father, you have promised to hear the prayers of those who ask in faith, those who pray with persistence, those who pray seeking justice and mercy. Hear now our prayers, we pray. Heavenly Father, you have planted in the heart of each one of us an instinct to pray. Teach us to pray openly, trustfully, confidently, unselfishly remembering the needs of others as well as our own. And teach us to be persistent in our prayer. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we bring to you the love, the daily work of each member of Christ's body. In constant prayer, may we learn your will and your ways of doing things until we work exclusively for your glory. We pray for your church, that your commandment to love one another will be right at the heart of all that it does. We pray for all who proclaim your word here, and ask upon them your blessing as they work to your glory across this benefice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for our local community and for the well-being of all in this village. We also pray for the spiritual health and welfare of this nation. We pray for our King Charles and his government and for all in authority at all levels in our society that they may lead with courage and wisdom. And we pray for the judiciary, for all involved in the court system, that true justice may be administered with mercy. And especially at this time, we pray for stability in government, that we may be quietly governed and justly governed. Father, in what we perceive to be unfavourable times, give us a true spent sense of your heavenly perspective and make us more aware of the blessings you shower upon us day by day. Lord, in your mercy. And yet we know that the current economic difficulties are causing real hardship for some. We hold them before you now. 
those who are fearful of what is to come, those who have no money to feed children or heat a home, those fearful of this winter. Father, we long for a more just society, a more just sharing of wealth, more just provision for those who have nothing. And we pray especially your blessing on the work of the sisters of the church, praying that they may be richly blessed, resourced with gifts and donations, and sustained in the practical work of showing your compassionate love. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we remember for you the world's great needs and its many sorrows. Bless all those countries where war is a way of life for so many and human tragedies cause so much despair and where godly kingdom, living, kingdom value living seems impossible. We do continue to cry out and pray for the people of Ukraine, for a ceasing of hostilities and loss of life and the terrible distraction. Bring the families of all the nations, divided and torn apart by conflicts, to your just and gentle rule. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Loving Father, we pray for ourselves and for our families, our friends and our neighbours. May we acknowledge our failings as well as our strengths as we seek to serve you by serving one another. We ask your blessing on those who have lost their way, those who have lost grip on reality, those deluding themselves or others. We pray for the confused, the harassed and the dejected, the abandoned, the neglected and the abused. We bring before you those who are ill and in pain, praying for those known personally to us and for those who have asked for our prayer, for Becky, Estelle, Ed and Alexandra, for Derek, Grace, Maureen and Don, for Christine, Lucy and Ian, who are sick or in need. And we keep in our prayers Sue, Joe, Sheila, Anne and Sophia. According to your will and your promises, grant them comfort and healing. Surround them with your tenderness. Hold the weak in the arms of your love and give hope and patience to those recovering. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Loving Father, surround all who mourn this day with your continuing passion. May their grief not turn them against you and may they know that you are always beside them, sharing in their sorrow. We remember those who have died, that they may know the eternal joy of living in your presence forever. Mary, Slooper, Anne Taylor, and John Millman. And we remember too Ronald Salisbury, whose anniversary of death occurs at this time. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, Help us never to give up praying for justice. Help us never to give up praying for fairness. Help us never to give up praying for healing. Help us never to give up praying. For to give up is to deny our faith in a God who answers prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, David. And so we stand together now to share God's peace, still at the moment from a safe distance. We hug in our hearts. God is love, and those who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. We offer one another a sign of peace. Peace be with you all. Peace be with you.
our offertory hymn in the red book this time. It's number 163. And that final verse asks us to place Christ at the very centre of all we are and all we do as individuals and as his body here. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God. From sunrise to sunset, this day is holy, for Christ has risen from the tomb, and scattered the darkness of death with light that will not fade. This day the risen Lord walks with your gathered people, unfolds for us your word, and makes himself known in the breaking of bread. And though the night will overtake this day, you summon us to live in endless light, the never-ceasing Sabbath of the Lord. And so with choirs of angels and with all the heavenly host, we proclaim your glory and join their unending song of praise.
We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again, he praised you, gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross, bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation. We proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people, gather us in your loving arms and bring us with Mary, the mother of our Lord, Andrew, Bridget, Nicholas and all the saints to feast at your table in heaven. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Let us pray with confidence as our Saviour Christ has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that Jesus died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us your gift of faith, that forsaking what lies behind and reaching out to that which is before, we may run the way of your commandments and win the crown of everlasting joy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. We say together, Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gates of glory. May we who share Christ's risen body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all children shall be free on the whole earth. It's your praise. Our closing hymn is number 55 in the green hymn book, when we remember that one day his kingdom will come in all its fullness and kings will bow before King Jesus. Let's stand to sing.
I, I omitted to mention at the beginning, David, thank you for mentioning John in your prayers. Many of you will probably remember John Millman, who, and you probably know that he, he died earlier this, this week. Remind me of his wife's name. Pam. Pam, yes. So do keep Pam and the family in your prayers as well. A very faithful servant of the Lord. And you mentioned the sisters in Bristol, and I know John was very involved with them, wasn't he, for, for many years there. And so we ask for God's blessing on us and those we love. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or conceive by the power which is at work among us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all the ages. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and all those you love and care for this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. So go in peace and in joy to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Amen. Amen. Amen.